Segoli, Nadio Lewis, Skanagoga, Skanago. In Oneida, I just said, greetings, what is the news? Are you with peace? I am with peace. Welcome week two. Welcome Vermont Law School Spring 2023 as we are talking about restorative justice in indigenous communities. I just have to say, absolutely am loving it so far. Thank you all for the responses and introductions in the group me so far. Love and learning who you are in relation to other peoples as well too. That's been phenomenal and fascinating and incredible. Thanks for opening your, your head and your heart in this process as we learn together. I know it's asynchronous, but I find that it's a pretty cool way for us to be able to find, stay connected throughout the week and put our minds together. As we say in Oneida in our opening prayer, let's put our minds together, so be it in our minds. Just wanted to give a shout out to each and every one of you for the responses so far. I wanted to go through, I just wanted to say, Bessie loved the video. I just wanted to say, I'm, I'm a lifelong learner alongside you. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I will do my best to support and guide you as best I can along the way. And I would just say, I really appreciate your humility. I appreciate just your ability, your willingness to learn. And I'm so excited to have you here and to continue to learn as you continue this practice as a restorative justice practitioner, working in circle practices and just learning about um, how it's used in different restorative, how it's used in different indigenous communities in different ways, whether it's restorative or sometimes just for community and for different reasons. Sylvie, really appreciate your question as well too, the one that you posed in the group me, as well as the one you put here as well too, in terms of this idea of what this looks like for this notion of accountability, uh, different conflicting worldviews, how do we reconcile, how do we make sense of these things, and the idea of your question of nation building and who has this idea, who has the ability to be able to have government to government relationships with the government, which I'll talk about in, our, in a minute in the lecture here, but indeed, this comes from settler colonialism, this comes from erasure, as you saw that that uh, video was titled the Indian problem, right? Which obviously we know for indigenous peoples um, being human beings, but as the, the federal government, this was the view of it. As we'll talk about before, it would be, um, I believe it's in 1820 when the it's Congress, they grant the responsibility for managing trade relations with tribes. They give it over to the, the Department of War. So, um, this is just some of the some of the history. You think about the extermination towards native peoples and how do we reconcile and make sense of those things as well too. So, I just I really appreciate you pointing out those differences and pointing out your own blind spots, right? And how we all have those as well too, and just being able to learn, be, being our best selves. So, I really appreciate that as well too. Just your your opening up and being willing willing to share and learn. Really appreciate you as well too, Xiao, for talking about this idea of healing and different your responses on that. Thanks for your responses from the article as well too. And looking at the idea of balance and interconnection of all things, being able to foster your empathy and respect. I love that idea. That definitely hits that on the head. Loving your neighbor as yourself and, and bringing in that theology from your own background. I think that's a phenomenal worldview, how we uh, enter into this space as well, too, of that. Um, how I've seen many different circles. It seems like they can have like uh, different uses, uh, different ideas behind it, and it. But it seems like if there's an overlap, if it's like a Venn diagram, it seems like a lot of that is love, is spirituality, it's having that connection. Uh, for the other, not viewing them as the other, but viewing us um, as a we, as a collective. And I love that. Going along here, really love that as well too. Zachary, uh, fascinating as well too. Appreciate your responses to the videos. And um, I just appreciate that as well too, is how we can help be a part in um, active part of healing as well too. So I love that. Um, uh, lo love, the, love the questions you brought up, love the ideas you brought up as well too. And love I love the conversation that uh, that ensued as well too, and just this ability to learn from one another. I really appreciate that. Alana, fantastic video, such an honor to learn alongside you as well too. So happy to have you in the class. Really appreciate that idea too that you of uh, the breakdown of the of the article and talking about how it comes from all these different places. Restorative justice, and I would even make an even updated article if I could now. That's kind of on my docket for things to do of even more tribes and even more different ways of this of unique different practices and practicing for millennia. Love how you point out as well too, Alana. How oftentimes it feels like it's just kind of a, a line like cool and these come from restorative practices like from indigenous communities we kind of stop there instead of continuing on or diving deeper or seeing how it's still being used now or the unique nature in each ways and like you were saying how some are restorative some are communities some are otherwise um, and it just uh, kind of depends on the community depends on the youth so I, I really appreciate that distinction as well too you make there happy to have you in the class um ansley aj great insight as well too um I like that notion as well too of um, this notion of looking at sovereigns, looking at tribal governments, and um, just uh, really appreciate your just kind of your as you unpack this idea of the history of the federal government in the United States, what this looks like as well too moving forward. 
fantastic response. Jackie as well, too. Thank you very much. I love that takeaway from, from Eddie, that the greatest gift we can give others is a gift of empathy. I know that's one that definitely resonates with me as well, too. And th good, definitely excellent uh, responses from the reading as well, too. I really like that response. Sam, happy to have you here as well, too. And um, just, yeah, you make an excellent point about there, uh, how the author, and a number of you all had used that one as well, too, just that uh, the that concept of 9-11 uh, and trauma and uh, just kind of the context that went along with that story as well, too. Um, just appreciate your breakdown of that. Happy to have you here, Rebecca. Really appreciate your breakdown of points as well, too. And the idea of just of kind of decolonizing, indigenizing our minds, looking at these different readings and videos here. Fantastic work, Joellen. I really appreciate your heart and your spirit and your response here, just in terms of that uh, that frustration, but also just that desire for accountability, that 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 strong passion and desire for justice. I can just feel it through your words and really appreciate it. Brandon, love the video as well, too. Really, really appreciated that. And you taking the time to organize those thoughts. And I, yeah, I just thought you had, you had some really good takeaways there in, in your video. Um, so I, I appreciated the things of uh, just talking about sovereignty, talking about um, this restorative process now can be used. Marissa, love the breakdown as well, too. Thank you very much for sharing. Talk about the sovereignty and agreements. And um, Carolina, appreciate that as well, too. It's really great in our office hours having that conversation with you about your own identity and what that make, how is that making sense of that as well, too. And really appreciate it. And just for everyone in general, as I, I talk about for each week, you, you can write either you know reactions, thoughts, critiques. It doesn't have to be all three. It could be could be one of those things, could be two, could be all three of those, could be kind of seeing what works for you, what jumps out at you, what you're willing to share with others to kind of make it having, making sense and making meaning of this time together. As it's been phenomenal already, obviously you all are just jumping in and giving each other phenomenal insights. So please keep on keeping on, loving that so far. Couple notes for the class so far, so we want to make an update. I know in the original syllabus, I said that everybody had to go to office hours, I think three times. Well, now it's uh, completely optional. so. No need to attend if you're not able to. Would love to have you if you can make it, but totally optional. So I know it's asynchronous and we all have our different lives moving at different speeds and doing different things. So check in on the group me, check in through the, the modules and the discussions. You can always email me or reach out to me as well too. Would love to continue the conversation, love to continue the learning, but office hours are optional. So don't have to do those, those three. With that being said, people, loving it. Let's keep on keeping on. I'm gonna pick back up for our lecture right here for our week two lecture and we will give it a go here. So thanks all for your patience. Invitation, not an obligation, but if you want to, as I've heard it said from one of my, my mentors, Dr. Pamela Taylor, who is uh, also a leader as well too uh, in the African nation of Kenya and also as a professor emeritus from Seattle University. Um, but Dr. Pamela Taylor, I remember asking, I was like, so when we're doing circles, like how many people do we need? Like, how does it have, to, how do we have to do this? And she's kind of laughing and, um, and she says, just, just one is what you need. I'm like, oh, cool. It's so like me and one other person. It's like, no, no, even like yourself. Like, how do you how do you speak to yourself? Like that can be restorative as well too. So love that mindset as well too. And we'll get into that story a little bit later. But my that colleague, um, Dr. Pamela Taylor, she tells a story about going to Africa with a group of people and they're going to Kenya to visit. It was Barack Obama's patrilineal grandmother. So his father's mom, which is patrilineal grandmother, he goes and they're in Kenya. And as he goes, as they all go with this group of people, um, Obama's grandmother is there and they're in a, they're met in a circle. Um, they're, uh, that, like, that's like how they, how, how they greet people. They're in a circle. And as they go around, um, Obama's grandmother would go to people and say, welcome home. And like would give them a big hug as well too. So I love that idea. When we talk about restorative practices, yes, we're talking about um, Turtle Island, which can sometimes be referred to as North and South America, but also I think about indigenous communities. We look at that map, native-land.ca, and I think of indigenous communities in Africa as well, too. And I, I think of um, different communities that use this practice as well. And um, a lesser known idea, even for people in Ireland, there's practices in Ireland where people using the traditional Irish language uh, and like having circles and uh, some of the, the elder people in this community um, in um, in Ireland, like still like holding circles and, and communicating in this way. So all that to be said, welcome to the show. Happy to have you all here for week two. Let's keep on keeping on. I want to talk a little bit about the federal relationship. I know that was brought up by Sylvie and uh, some of the others from the videos and some from some of the readings. So it talks about in the Constitution is the Indian Commerce Clause, which is Article One, Section Eight, Clause Three, and it recognizes 
um, United States is to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. So this is this uh, that outlined in the Constitution this as relationship as sovereigns, as as their own as a nations within nations, so to speak. Now, also as we look at things that are somewhat tough to reconcile, to say the least, and we look at historical trauma, this is in the Declaration of Independence, oftentimes cited as a beautiful, profound document. If you look at paragraph 29 of the Declaration of Independence, it says he has excited domestic insurrections among us, amongst us, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the quote merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So obviously, even from the get-go, just um, a horrific dehumanizing um, false idea as well, too, as you'll learn from the week two videos as well, too, that the United States form of government, our form of federalism, our form of three branches of government, our what our Supreme Court is based off of, whatever House of Representatives is based off of, what the Senate is based off of, what the President is based off, of, that all comes from the great law of peace by the Haudenosaunee, Going back to August 11th, 1142, we know that because of a solar eclipse using astronomy and science as well too. And from the oral tradition, 1142, the longest running democracy to this day. And there were leaders from the Second Constitutional Convention, uh, leaders from the Haudenosaunee who were invent invited to come speak at the Second Constitutional Convention to describe more in detail how this confederacy works from the Haudenosaunee. And the Haudenosaunee urged the, the, the 13 colonies and said, you know, if you all want to be, you would be a lot stronger if you came together um, as, as one. So if you ever look at a $1 bill and you look at the $1 bill and you'll see this eagle holding those 13 arrows in its claw, well, that is a reference to the original license of the Haudenosaunee when the peacemakers asked for, said, one of you give me an arrow um, from what these five different uh, chiefs, these five different leaders of these different tribes, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, at once warring and then buried their weapons underneath the great white fir tree of peace. If you ever hear the euphemism, bury the hatchet, this comes from the Haudenosaunee as well. Uh, but the peacemaker said, give me one of your arrows, snaps an arrow. Says, each of you give me an arrow, has a bundle of five arrows, and says, look, together you cannot be broken. Together we are stronger. So that's where we get that idea of the United States. Also, that eagle, that comes from the Haudenosaunee as well, too, is on top of that great white fir tree of peace, there was um, an eagle sitting for the Haudenosaunee, and this eagle was to look at, as you could see, for miles, to look for any oncoming uh, conflicts or any um, things on the horizon as, it, as the Haudenosaunee was um, having peace. Surrounded by peace, they would offer up to three times for different tribal nations. If uh, other nations, um, they would offer them peace. And if they did not take peace, then they would eventually sometimes go to battle. Um, once the battle was over, the idea was um, they weren't going to, if the Haudenosaunee, they, they would not go into other people's territories. They would not, um, or once, once the war was over, they would not try to convert people. All they would say, the only agreement was that they would make, that they would never, they would never have war again. That, that the community who, who went to war said they would never, they would never have war again. So anyways, uh, just some different notions here of our origins of the country, the United States, which comes from the Haudenosaunee. And then once the country is formed, really this uh, extermination, which would be a definition of genocide towards native people. So when we talk about uh, restorative practices, we talk about this historical harms. It's important to understand his, the history as well, too, um, of kind of how things come to be. When we talk about harms, needs, recommendations. Uh, so let's look at some impactful federal policy towards indigenous people. This is really a week seven thing. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. I wanted to hit on some of these points. I'll go into more detail on week seven. So just kind of a, um, a teaser trailer, so to speak. But for Doctrine of Discovery, that's 1493. It's this palpable bull and it's, re it's putting forth, and this is still active to this day. It has not been rescinded yet. So let me tell you about it. It's the idea that any lands that have been, that are founded um, in this like West, um, in the Western hemisphere, uh, that these idea, if these lands are not inhabited by Christian peoples and these lands are considered terra nullis, which is a Latin for this idea of being um, empty earth or void earth. Um, so they would, that there would be, if there's this idea how people like Columbus and um, colonists were able to come here and saying, well, under the doctrine of discovery, there was no land rights. And this is even, uh, there's a Supreme Court case that's um, right here. This is in 2005. And this is where it's city of Cheryl, New York versus Oneida Indian Nation of New York. And the person giving the majority opinion here is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, usually known for being very progressive, um, uh, very, I guess, equity-minded. And uh, in this case, uh, very much the opposite. Uh, here, Ruth Bader Ginsburg argues that the, under the doctrine of discovery, that fee tumbled to the lands occupied by Indians when the colonists arrived became vested in the sovereign, first the discovering European nation and later the original states in the United States. So this is 2005 Supreme Court case, right? We talk about separation of church and state. So literally being the opposite, a palpable coming from the Pope 
and then it's still being used as legal precedent for different things that are happening today. Um, again, we'll go into more of these uh, laws uh, in week seven as well too. Just wanted to uh, kind of outline that as well too. Uh, some of these that are interesting here, for instance, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, 1978. Up until then, it was even though we're uh, freedom of religion, one of one of our basic rights within the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Uh, yet for Native people, it wouldn't be until 1978. Um, that this would be the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. And there are still different circumstances I'll show you in court cases where even then their, their religious rights have not been upheld, even in the reaffirmation of the Religious Freedom Act in 1996. Um, and there's still different, different areas where American Indian people are still not being given their proper rights uh, for their religious rights as well too. You look at the 1990 here, we're looking at Native American Languages Act. That's a key one. I'm, I'm born in 89, so I'm not terribly old. I'm 33, so this is during my lifetime. And the idea was that it was illegal for Native peoples to speak their own traditional languages up until 1990. So you uh, putting this to context, we talk about the Indian boarding schools, right? That was one of the kill the Indian, save the man. People were oftentimes beaten, killed for speaking their traditional languages. And if children weren't at the same schools, they were oftentimes be separated, put at different schools. Um, so even when I was a even when I was a child, like I was in the bathtub, my grandma would sing Oneida songs to me, uh, "Snagila, Snagila, Ne the Arewa," which means drink, milk, drink, milk, drink, milk, just like a pig. Anyways, <laughs> funny little side note. But the idea was that it was illegal. That silly song there of just singing Oneida for being able to maintain our culture at the same time in a beautiful way of doing that was illegal. And even then, check this out. Um, through our different world wars, like World War One, World War Two, maybe you've heard of the Navajo Code Talkers. Um, these are the more famous ones. There were actually up to 33 different tribal nations who were used. And it wouldn't be until the 1970s where this was declassified, as this was classified information to be able to use tribal languages across enemy lines to be able to, say, to, to share messages that could not be decoded, that hadn't been written down, or had not been exposed to different, um, different forces that we were fighting against. So this, law, so this language, which had been really beaten and people killed for speaking it, still maintained and held on to, which would then be used um, by different code talkers, up to 33 different tribal nations across many different major conflicts in the United States. Um, and then only in 1990 would it be, okay, now it's legal to speak our languages. So it's really, it is amazing that many tribes still have their language to this day. Um, unfortunately, some tribes do not have as high language retention. Um, when we think about colonization, I think that um, it's this notion as well too, I think people can have like a lot of like guilt or shame for not being able to know our ways. And just also it's, it's important to know like this is colonization, like that it was that was not your fault. That's a purposeful erasure of those things trying to be taken from you. So yes, um, fight the good fight and trying to get those things back. And But oftentimes I was talking um, to Carolina about this today as well too. It can, uh, I've heard it said for many different communities, but for tribal communities, I've heard it said when, it, when an elder passes away, it's like a library passes down oftentimes like this, this knowledge, some things that are either recorded or not recorded. So um, shout out to anyone out there, the power of YouTube, power of recording the oral tradition. I think it's a, I think it's a great tool for us um, here in 2023 and uh, moving forward. Looking ahead here, um, some different ones I wanted to share about here. The Truth and Healing and Commission on Indian Boarding School Policies Act. This is September 2021. It was put forth. I mean, it's still in Congress, whether it's, it's still being voted on, whether or not we want to move forward with this in the United States. Maybe you've heard of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. And the idea was to kind of acknowledge some of the um, Indian residential schools over the, 100, the 150 Indian residential schools in Canada. Talk about that. I have some um, friends, Native friends from uh, First Nations people in Canada, they talked about it can, what can sometimes feel like, yes, this is more than we've done in the United States, but it still felt like lip service to a lot of people, like acknowledgments without some actual progress being done towards it. Um, the United States, you know, we still have yet to really, really, um, like whether or not like they're vote, voting on Congress, whether or not we want to acknowledge like these things have happened or not as well, too. We even think about things like CRT, critical race theory, the idea of like, that's the idea to be saying that other people were treated differently throughout the history of the United States. And I'd say, well, for the Indian boarding schools, people literally killed for it. Like how many schools do we know that have cemeteries built into other schools? So I think to be saying that people, Native Americans were, were not treated differently, I think that'd be ignoring a huge injustice. And I, I think that would be a travesty in my, uh, in my own personal opinion. Moving along here, people, um, we'll go in week seven, we'll talk about all those, court, uh, those statutes some more. Influential court cases here. You heard about the Marshall Trilogy. Johnson v. McIntosh, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, Wooster versus Georgia. Some really um, terrible things were there where Johnson v. McIntosh brings in that doctrine of discovery. Cherokee Nation v. Georgia talks about describing native people as wards of the state. And, I, and I've heard it described by different native scholars, legal scholars, where these things are so harmful because these Supreme Court justices are taking these narratives, these kind of like grand lies and just 
putting them into the majority opinion or putting them into this court, uh, the rulings of the Supreme Court cases, which then be used as precedent uh, for others as well, too. Um, so really harmful when you look at these. Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, 1903, it says that the United States Congress can abrogate treaties whenever they want to. And abrogate means basically you can stop whenever, whenever you want, whenever you see fit, which is, um, I don't know how you really consider that to be a treaty or a fair, fair deal. Um, Again, we'll, we'll look more at week seven, some more of these as well, too. But uh, just some of those I wanted you to be familiar with a little bit before we go more into detail on it. Uh, another one, we look at the historical harms here. This is from the Winona Daily Republican, 1863, from a, a newspaper um, in Minnesota. Here, the top part of it, it's a ballot for Republican union nominations. And on the bottom here, uh, pretty harmful, pretty hard to read here. But I do want to acknowledge, educate, and honor, as if I, if I don't talk about these stories, if I, if I sugarcoat or if I water it down, I'm doing injustice to the people who, who um, had to endure those things. And I think it's best to be able to honor these people. As oftentimes, many people, um, I've heard it said when we help heal our, ourselves, we're help healing our ancestors, we're help he healing those historical harms, and we're acknowledging and trying to bring peace and trying to bring light to those situations, which is, again, how I was taught about restorative justice through my cousin, Eddie Cornelius Groff, of being in circles to hold space to be a container to support one another. So let us support one another as I share this here. It talks about how the state reward for dead Indians has been increased to $200 for every, um, this is a racial slur. This was the, why the Washington football team changed its name, one of the key terms. Um, now for many, many of my native professors won't even say that name. They'll just say the word our skin. For every our skin sent to purgatory. This sum is more than the dead bodies of all the Indians east of the Red River are worth. Um, so harmful, um, incredibly harmful, 1863. Um, and just really uh, dehumanizing Native peoples as well, too, this um, extermination. Uh, look at the supremacy clause of the Constitution. Don't be fooled by the, the infographic here. Just somebody messed up their Roman numerals. But the idea is a supreme, the, the supremacy clause is saying here that um, the Constitution and the law of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof in all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. So. As we talk about all those different treaties that have been made, look at digitreaties.org, those over 374 federally ratified treaties. Uh, those are all supposed to be the supreme law of the land according to the constitution. So it's just a reminder of those responsibilities as well too. In California here, these are some um, advertisements they had as they were paying, paying for bounties in California. Um, oftentimes, for instance, I, I grew up in, um, I, I move around a lot, but I came to California in fifth grade and in fourth grade in the public schools, all this, the students had built these, uh, you had you had to, it was their part of the curriculum was to build missions and the mission systems that made it seem like it's really beautiful and like, oh, this is so great. And there's like a troubadour out front playing a guitar and you can buy these sets at Michael's. Um, right? the, the history they don't really talk about at all is that these are all, all those missions are built by indigenous enslaved peoples as well too. That every single one of those mission sites are mass burial sites for in California indigenous people who were enslaved and then killed as well too. Father J. Sarah, Junipero Serra, as many Native people um, I know who were uh, protesting at the time when Junipero Serra was in the, in the midst of being canonized to become Father J. Serra. Uh, but the idea for, for Junipero Serra talked about it in his writings, how um, the people who were like working at, the, at, these, at these missions, um, that they would um, like sexually abuse the people who were working there. And if anyone tried to stop them, um, they would just like kill those people as well too. Horrible, like, these things are documented. It's awful. Um, we think about like the, you ever go to Knott's Berry Farm and a lot of you are on the on the, um, on the East Coast, you're like, what the heck is that? It's an amusement park out here in Southern California. And there's like a part where it's like, it's really glorified the idea of kind of like the gold rush and gold mining and like, um, and it's and make it all fun and it's great. And maybe you learn about that in school and how the gold rush was like a really exciting time of like, go West, young man, go West. Well, think about who are all the people who are already there, right? This is already all occupied lands by indigenous peoples right here. So um, in the 1860s, some advertisements from California um, and I've heard it's, there was uh, anywhere from $5 per decapitated head of indigenous people from 25 cents. Um, the, the state of California uh, is paying this out, the state, state sanctioned genocide. Uh, the first year the Cal state of California rolls out this program, they pay out a million dollars. The second year they brought up this program, they pay out a million dollars. Uh, so horrific, right? If you're looking at the, um, on the smallest scale for each year, that's 200,000 people each year. Um, and if it's 25 cents, you know, that's, uh, that's 4 million people. So you know, between 200,000 to 4 million people each year uh, that that occurred. Um, and also there's, uh, you can see here an advertisement for Mountaineers, people um, looking to serve in this battalion to, um, to fight against the Indians in Humboldt, Humboldt Military District. 
Um, so just just getting average people part of the state to help be part of this to be mountaineers. Um, this is one that's more recent as well too. We talk about um, what what when I think about like restorative justice, I think I'm reminded by Alana's words. Sometimes it's not always um, in a circle or what that can look like as well too. So in this one as well too, Colorado governor voids an 1864 order to kill Native Americans. This is from August 17th, 2021. So up until August 17th, 2021, in the state of California, it was not only legal to kill Native Americans, but there was an order to kill them. Not only legal, but it was an order to kill them, Native American people, Native people, uh, from 1864 until 2021. And you can see here, this is a really big deal as this governor is being um, handed these traditional medicines, uh, medicines and there's people, tr tribal leaders here to, to see this historical uh, thing being signed which obviously I'm sure all of your reactions may be disgusted, infuriated. How did it take this long? And it's like, yes, how did it take this long? Um, there's still rights that need to be, uh, there's still things that need to be righted as well too. As you learn, the more you learn about these things, there's, um, it definitely goes deep, a lot of layers to it, but it's important to know um, as we learn about these things, know that you are a human being who is worthy of love. You have a capacity to make great change in this world. You are intelligent, you are well-equipped, you have a highly skilled, uh, you can help be part of either as an ally or as a native person, um, and about this uh, this empowered future for indigenous and native peoples. We humanize and we hear each other's stories and we respect and we and we uh, learn from one another and that we are all together. And I've heard it said, what is the ocean if not a multitude of water droplets all working together? So we're all working towards this collective change of, of hope, of resiliency. As Chief Warren Lyon says, you never take away the people's hope. I love that. Not, not taking away your hope, still hope people, there's still hope. And I've heard it said by the Haudenosaunee, as long as there are people, there is still hope uh, for the, the Oneida as well. So as we talk about some more hard things to talk about here, Secretary of the Inter Interior, um, J.A. Krug in 1950, signing a contract to allow the government to purchase 155,000 acres of land on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota. The sale was made without the consent of the reservation's business council chairman, George Gillette, who weeps as he watches Krug. Um, throughout history, uh, I've heard it said by people who are not as well versed in this subject. They'll say, you know, what are you, what are you talking about, TJ? Like, you know, Indians lost the war, get over it. It's like, well, no, there was actually um, broken treaties, deception, lies, basically most um, corrupt dealings you can think about to kind of to to get a to try to one up or to really eliminate Native American people has really been used throughout history, and it's been documented as well too. And in this situation, um, again, without the 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 rightful uh, consent of the business council chairman, I've heard of different treaties that. May have been signed by people who were not actually the leaders of their tribe. They might be like asking you or me to sign for the United States. They might be um, giving people alcohol to put them like, as you saw in that the video about the, the quote Indian problem, but the idea of like putting people in agreeable agreeable state of mind. So you've heard about some of this already, and I saw it in some of your discussions. But you can look at DigiTreaties.org, the previous 374 ratified Indian treaties. I know a lot of you, whether you're getting your master's, whether you've been a paralegal, or you're a JD. Um, whatever you are, you human beings who are worthy of love, I'm grateful for you. And you can use your skill set. You can go on this website. Uh, and you can look up these treaties. All of them are still written in old English. They're some of them are like water damage. Some of them they're all scanned in there. If you could take the time and the resiliency and just being persistent, if if someone made it a project to type all those to put those into uh, just to document them where they're they're typed up to preserve them that way, and people really to notify tribes of their different rights that they have. These things are still happening today whether we'll talk about soon, whether this was the Dakota Access Pipeline or whether this is um, line three that's going on in, in Minnesota, this, this um, oil sands tars pipeline. Um, but these these land rights, these water rights, these fishing rights, like these things are, are key when different companies right now are trying to exploit and trying to really um, try to push over native people and their rights as well too. Um, this is, taking from Carlisle Indian School, um, one of the files here. And I, I share with you this file as this an example throughout history of firsthand document from my own family. Um, I remember my relatives talking about this. They were the ones who pointed it out to me. I was the one who like shared different things through Facebook for, um, I think it's like in 2012, 2013, maybe it's 2014. Carlisle Indian School made their, their, their records public for the first time. So I was like sharing things with my family. And there's my great uncle Ben, rest in peace, great uncle Ben, if you're in the spirit world, love you, dude, love you very much. Um, and he would talk about how uh, he's like, you know, it's so wild because he's like, he's like my uh, my mom and dad, which is my uh, great grandma and great grandpa. They didn't know how to write. They didn't know any English. So he's like, they didn't sign any of those documents because they didn't know how to write English. So, for instance, this is my great grandmother, supposedly, but it's not. This is a government document with her forged signature right here. And we know it is not her signature because she did not know how to write English or speak English, let alone write in person. 
right, let alone right and perfect cursive. So there's just one example of, of government documents being forged as well too. This is an example within my own family. Um, and we talk about some of that um, reconciliation, restoration, some of the hope. Look, this is a, an example, Jim Thorpe, his Olympic medals uh, reinstated. And this is from um, this last, this past summer, well, for, from until that time, Jim Thorpe, who had served um, for the US Olympic team in 1912, and he's doing this before he's a US citizen. So it's not until 1924 that Native Americans are granted citizenship. So he's doing this, he wins these medals, and eventually he, these medals are stripped from him as it was found that he had been paid um, with the equivalent of maybe like $300 or so in today's dollars for playing amateur baseball. And many other people had done it at the time as well too, but really it was, a lot of people thought it was because of his race, because of his identity as a native person that, that he was really targeted, uh, made an example of, um, and his medals were stripped. It wouldn't be until later that he has just been fully reinstated as the sole winner of the Olympic gold medal. So long after he's passed, long since passed away, um, but I know his family has been pushing for it for a long time and many other native people. So there is hope, change can happen people, change can happen. Uh, an example of some of this resistance and um, I think of those, uh, I think I think restorative actions as we kind of deal, we talk about all that historical, we talk about, it's not just things happening to native people, there's a response always as well too, always resistance, there's always a response. And this example is the occupation of Alcatraz Island, which maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, 1969 to 1971 by a group called Indians of All Tribes, occupy this land as it goes back to an old Fort Laramie agreement from 1868 that says that any federal government, um, any, any uh, property that's no longer being used by the federal government can be used by native people. Well, Alcatraz Island used to be a federal penitentiary, then it closed down its, its doors. Um, so, so many other uh, tribal leaders, they took this as an opportunity to occupy this land to make an example of it. And it really brought media and brought attention um, towards native peoples as well too. And it helped with like, in terms of identity, there's this idea of what's called the red power movement. This is happening as well too during the human rights movement, um, 1960s and 70s. Told you about line three, you can look at your own um, at resist line three, you can look at resistline3.org to see what's going on right now as well too. With Enbridge um, happening with Anishinaabe in uh, Karankawa land. Uh, so this notion to stop big oil. And Chief Warren Lyons talks about this a lot as well too, this notion. How it, we are in a time now where corporations are like having more rights than human beings. The idea of a corporations trying to trump and take um, over human rights when these are these issues are so important. And it's not a matter of if these these pipelines break; it's a matter of when. And when they do, then the water around it is no longer drinkable. The land is no longer able to be used for farming or different things. Um, so, as as the chant said when I was at, uh, I, was, oh, I was only there for a day at the Dakota Access Pipelines. But there's a chant as as says, uh, "Water is life. You can't drink oil. Water is life." Mini Wachoni, water is life. Um, so this is um, from line three as well too. It's the US holds treaties with the Anishinaabeg designed, uh, signed in 1854, 1855 and 1867, which guarantee the right to hunt, fish, gather and travel on treaty territories. So this thing how line three breaks these treaty rights as well too. This is an example as well too in Hawaii. You think about indigenous people in Hawaii as well too. And this is some of the, um, and I apologize for mispronouncing here, but the Ka'ai or protectors uh, blocking the access to road uh, Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii on July 15, 2019. This is the, the TMT as for this uh, telescope that many uh, different people there are trying to, are protesting and saying, these are on our sacred mountains here. We do not want this here as well too, that um, we wanna recognize our sacred sites and our, our, our land is very important to us and our connection to our land as well too. So it's an example of this resistance as well too. This is a picture from the Dakota Access Pipeline. Unarmed people, when I was there as well too, there's spray paint everywhere that said, your prayer is your weapon, right? That's it. This is going on here. This is in November of 2016. Um, so right now it's, when I was there in January of 2017, and when I was there, it was one degrees and the sun was out and people were talking about like how warm it had, like how they're grateful how, how warm it was. So here it's, um, sub freezing temperatures, so below, easily below 32 degrees, and, um, if not closer to, um, probably zero here, especially at nighttime. So there being people here, unarmed people, protesters, activists who are trying to help Mother Earth here, being shot at by water cannons, uh, being, um, I remember one of the first days I went to meeting one of the water protectors there. And um, there was this person, he asked me, he said, have you ever seen a rubber bullet? I'm like, I've never seen a rubber bullet. And he, and in my hand, he puts it like, well, this is what they're shooting at us when we we're on the front lines. He says, um, have you ever felt the riot, like the mace bags? I've like, never felt one of those. He takes it out. He says, this is like the little, there's a really hard, really dense, I mean, rock hard bean bag. He's like, this is what they'd use um, after they ran out of the rubber bullets. 
And he's like, and once it ran out of those, that the BBs from inside those, like that's what they shot at us next. And he puts puts them all in my hand. I'm just hands like shaking. I'm holding these things. I don't know what to do. And I asked the person, says, okay, if I give you a hug, he says, yeah, you could do that. I'm just like, just so grateful. And I had so much gratitude for these people. I'm like, oh my gosh, like you're giving up so much. When I was there, people had, I'd ask people, I'm like, how long have you been here for? Like, well, I was, I came out for a few days and that was like six months ago or like seven months ago. And just like people's stories of their willingness. I'm like, you're all our heroes. Like we're not heroes. Like anybody would do the same thing. Just the amount of humility from people. And it was not just indigenous people, you know, it's people from all over the world. Very beautiful to see this coalition of people. Um, one of these, these moments as well too, a really hard moment uh, for uh, native peoples, but also a, a I think it's been a revitalizing moment for people coming together and realizing how strong our voices, the collective voice as well too. Some of these pictures as well too of unarmed people uh, defending the sacred. Uh, you can ch check out some more about that as well too if you're not familiar with it. Some of you may be more, more aware, um, but just wanted to share that. So I like this idea for, for restoration, uh, this idea from John Trudell, the people must take the political system under their control. Love John Trudell, highly recommend YouTube video named Trudell. If you're curious more about that, great documentary. Um, has been com compared, I've heard different leaders, Gary Farmer, um, a Haudenosaunee actor, compared John Trudell to like a, a Socrates, a Plato or Aristotle for, for uh, Native peoples, but phenomenal thinker, phenomenal leader. And also we think about some of those people who are in those forms of government now. So we saw like that picture of J.A. Krug from 1950, who was the Secretary of the Interior person at the time. Uh, well, now we have the, for the first time ever, a Native person who is in a role which helps oversee native lands, and that is the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, who is Pueblo of Laguna. For the first time, we have a National Parks Director who is a native person. This is Chuck F. Sams III from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Kansas the third Congressional District Representative is Therese Davids of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin. And we look at here, Paulette Jordan, who is Coeur d'Alene, served in the Idaho House of Reps from 2014 to 2018. So there's some people who are being the change they want to see in the world as well, too. Um, I do believe that we can bring restoration, you can bring that through um, kind of reimagining, indigenizing, decolonizing the different systems that we have in place. I've heard that decolonization, it's, um, I've heard it described as using the master's tools to deconstruct, deconstruct the master's house. And then what do we reconstruct in its place is the question as well too. I love, love this quote as well too. One of my favorites right here from this Lieutenant Governor of the Zuni Pueblo, Carlton uh, Bocati, and I apologize for mispronouncing uh, Carlton's last name. Love this quote. What can be a better avenue of restorative justice than giving tribes the opportunity to participate in the management of lands their ancestors were removed from? Love that. What can be a better form of avenue of restorative justice than giving tribes the opportunity to participate in the management of lands their ancestors were removed from? Think of that question. Love that a lot. And I love that. We've and we've already seen it through uh, Stock F. Sam's the third. They have about 80 compacts so far between different tribal governments and different um, different parks for having like co-stewardship of different parks and co-management of those lands. This was a change.org that I created. And I would definitely encourage you all to check it out as well too. And it's just a, it's an asking for co-stewardship of all state and national parks with indigenous tribal nations. That's what could be a better form of restorative justice than having native peoples who they were displaced from those lands, having, having say and having management over those lands as well too. I think it's a really powerful step. I think it's one that we could totally do. Very, very doable. And I love this idea as we think about as each other in our relation to one another as human beings. Love this. Every group of human beings shares the same stars. And if Earth is not, and if the Earth is not your mother, are you from Mars? The great, uh, well, quote here from Prolific the Rapper in this song called Black Snakes, which uh, shows the Dakota Access Pipeline as well too. Highly recommend looking on YouTube for that video as well. So as we talk again about these different practices, and Alana nailed it perfectly and articulated it nicely in the video, saying that um, you know each one of these is so unique, and each one of these is different as well too. And, um, and as we, um, by just by just saying, oh yeah, it's indigenous practices and moving on, it's like we're really doing injustice towards these different practices and their unique nature, um, how they're used, how they're used to this day. Um, I love that as well too. Um, I wasn't, I can't remember um, who it was, but it's, it's such a good point. The idea of that um, oftentimes we do circle practices like, oh, I'm just going to grab whatever this thing right here to be my my talking piece, whatever, cool. And like for as you point out, like how different that is than like using like an eagle feather, which has like spiritual properties. It's like never allowed to touch the ground, which um, like is part of, um, you yeah, have this responsibility to never tell the truth with it, like it's spiritual properties. And this is just like one example, right? And um, other other tribes will use different pieces or different talking pieces, talking sticks. Um, we'll call them different things as well too. We talk about the Apache having a burden basket, uh, Lakota using a sacred pipe and packing it a certain way, uh, rotating it clockwise, uh, 
pulling from it and passing it clockwise as well too. Um, and indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing here to the uh, Huakua, Huakua, um, using a speaker staff is what they call it here. Uh, Maori in New Zealand have used a toko toko, a ceremonial talking stick as well too for indigenous peoples there. And um, Akon chiefs in Western Africa use a linguist staff, and I apologize if I mispronounce here, Okiyami Poma as a royal spokesperson. And the idea is that there's so many different practices and different continents, uh, different peoples, um, unique with some similarities and commonalities. Uh, um, I think humanizing, listening with respect and sharing, uh, but each unique as well too. Um, just pointing out some of those stories. Um, and um, this note as well too, before I go to the syllabus, I wanna tell you a quick story. And this one is from a, a Diné person. And uh, this person, um, I believe their name is Arlie. And I was just at the Wild Horse Pow Wow, and I think I was in 2016. I was one of the powwows for the, I was one of the chairs for this Pow Wow, which was like a big, big honor. So we were learning from Arlie, this Diné elder, me and my friend Kaplan, who was helping with this thing, um, for this event in Hawaii with indigenous people. So we were coming together. He told us to come very close and he told us his story. And he said, um, at one point, all of creation was together. And this bear said, look what I can do. And this bear took this tree, Boom, ripped, ripped it out of the ground and put it on the ground. And this deer came over and said, look what I can do. And this deer with the tree, the tree right there, boom, jumps it over in one jump and kept running. And the human being says, well, look what I can do. If I close my eyes, I can imagine a world like this one, only better. And Arlie told me, our responsibility as human beings is to bring people to that imagined place. So I'm calling on each and every one of you people, as you close your eyes, you imagine that a world like this one only better, I encourage you, it is your responsibility to help bring people to that imagined place. And Chief Warren Lyons reminds us oftentimes people talk about saying, my rights, my rights, my rights, but what about my responsibility? What about our actions and that vision for generations to come? So absolutely love, love it, people. Really, really excited to continue learning from you all in the modules, in the group me as well too. Just pulling up our syllabus for Looking at your reading for this week as well too. We are week two. So uh, for this week, it's just the one video of a, either a two to five minute, um, two to five minute video after, in response to these readings. So you're gonna read from the Justice's Healing Book, um, this nice different compilation of different stories from different tribal nations, different perspectives. So have an open head, open heart when you're reading this as well too. Here's some of the chapters you'll see here. Uh, here's our YouTube playlist for those videos to watch right here, six through 10. If you're watching this video, then you're gonna watch these next videos as well too. Uh, looking particularly at that great law of peace. Maybe it's a history you're familiar with, maybe it's one you're not so familiar with, but looking at how these people came together in a circle, my ancestors, still to this day, using the longest running form of democracy since August 11th, 1142, and still to this day. So hopefully maybe you learned something, maybe you can share something with someone you know. Maybe you're an educator, maybe you can use your platform to help others as we educate, as we acknowledge, educate, and honor. Action item to do before Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Creating your two to five minute video or a five to 10 census write up. Love the write ups, love the videos, whatever you want to do. I love them both. It's either your reactions, thoughts, or critiques. It doesn't have to be all three. You can choose one. You could, uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. I just want it to be something that gives you purpose, gives you meaning. I it feels like it's, it's a value of your time as you're responding to it. And it really has already been a value of seeing how you all are having your ideas bounce off one another, I, bouncing off one, and I, one another. It really is. Let's put our minds together. So be it in our minds, like we say in the Oneida, our opening prayer. Uh, just check in with that community peacemaking circle, putting a response in our class group me. This week, we're going to talk about acknowledgments, and we're going to talk about agreements as well, too. So acknowledge, acknowledgments and agreements in the group me. And then I want you all spending 10 minutes connecting in nature. And I do believe it's very important that we view nature as our relative, not as something to be conquered, not as something to be exploited. But uh, I've heard it said by different leaders, if you viewed that, um, if you viewed that, that ocean like as a relative, if you viewed um, the grass is a relative, you the trees is a relative, then you wouldn't be so willing uh, just to destroy them as well too. So I think there's a lot to be said. I know um, I recently heard um, one of the um, uh, legal advisors to the Yurok Nation and they talked about how they had argued personhood for one of their water bodies of water in their, uh, in their tribal nation of trying to get legal rights that way and being successful. Um, but really viewing that not only on the legal level, but on a deep spiritual, personal, emotional level, what does it mean to view all of relation as your relatives. And I know um, for the Haudenosaunee, at least I can speak for 
uh, the Haudenosaunee. This is a lot of this idea of being present, recognizing you're, you're connected to all things, that everything is interrelated. That's a lot of crossover and a lot of carryover to some Buddhist principles as well too. Um, I used to work at a yoga studio for a while and I love this notion from one of my teachers named Alex Crow. And Alex, if you've ever heard the phrase, um, don't, just do, don't just stand there, do something, if you've heard that phrase. So Alex Crow would flip it on its head and say, don't just do something, stand there. <laughs> so I encourage you to not just do something, but just to stand there for 10 minutes each week. I encourage you, as we're oftentimes I'm described, we are described as human doings, but all, rarely are we actually human beings where we are just being and we are. So whatever your spiritual beliefs, whatever your personal beliefs, but I just encourage you just to, to breathe, to be present, they're giving gratitude, whatever that is. But I encourage you to, to connect in that throughout the seven week process, try to make a habit of doing that as um, it's your assignment. You got to do it, people. You're in law school. You go spend some time in nature. <laughs> and I definitely encourage you all to take care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I really can't wait to hear all your responses in the group me and to the module two responses well too. That's it, people. Just wanted to say you, yes, you are a human being who is worthy of love. Sit up nice and tall, a string going through your head, the deepest breath of love you had all day, breathing in some love. Exhale some love. I've been Dr. Reed. You've been amazing. Take care, everybody. I love you. Until next time, everybody. Love you.